morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Monda Miyangwa, and I am the director of the Africa program at the Wilson Center, and I will be the moderator for this session. I want to start by welcoming all of you to day two of Yali 10 Summit and to wishing you all a happy Africa Day to everyone on the continent. We got off to a terrific start yesterday, and day two promises to be just as exciting and engaging. To kick off this morning, we will have our keynote focus on youth as drivers of Africa's economic transformation and development. I know that you all are rearing to go on this one. We saw all your comments coming in the chat box yesterday, so I know this is an issue that is near and dear to your heart. We will discuss the role of Africa's youth as change agents or drivers of the continent's transformation and development. We will also look at the challenges and opportunities in the social, economic, and governance spheres, and all of those opportunities and challenges that the continent presents to youth more importantly, we will hear some concrete actions that can and must be taken to address the challenges and amplify the opportunities in order that Africa's youth can exercise and bring their full potential to bear on the continent's future. With this brief context, let me introduce our speakers, and then we'll roll we'll right into it. Our first speaker this morning will be Mr. Travis Adkins, who will commemorate Africa Day on behalf of the U.S. government, speak to the importance of U.S.-Africa relations and the role of youth within the broader context of U.S.-Africa <clears throat> relations, and particularly on this special day of Africa Day. Mr. Travis Atkins serves as a Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Bureau of Africa at the United States Agency for International Development, otherwise known as USAID. Previously, he was a lecturer of African and Security Studies at the Walsh School of Foreign Service University. He has also taught in the Georgetown Prison Scholars Programs as part of the university's Prison and Justice Initiative. As an international development leader, he has over two decades of experience working in governance, civil society, and refugee and migration affairs in over 50 countries across the continent and the Middle East. This includes serving as a staff director of the House Subcommittee on Africa and working with leading NGOs and think tanks, as well as within several branches of the United Nations system. He also has served in numerous international election observation missions in Africa and the Middle East with the National Democratic Institute and has been a regular contributor to the national and international media outlets on African affairs. He's a graduate of Fisk University, one of the nation's uh, historically black colleges and universities. I've known Mr. Hatkins for many years and I know he's passionate about uh, US-Africa relations. So it's an honor for us to have him today to commemorate Africa Day on behalf of the U.S. government. Travis, over to you, my friend. Yes, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, uh, Dr. Muyangwa. Uh, and let me thank first our organizers, uh, the Wilson Center, uh, the State Department, and all of the staff of USAID who have made this uh, morning and this week's events um, a success. I can't go on, of course, also without thanking all of the Yali alumni and staff, all of the folks in the regional leadership centers for Yali, in addition to our uh, State Department staff, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the staff of the Mandela Washington Institute uh, and partners, uh, also the staff of IREX, who's played a key role uh, in making the Yali Initiative a success uh, over the course of the past 10 years. And so I would just want to share with everyone first that it is my great honor uh, to be here as a representative of the U.S. government, uh, as a representative of USAID to you all this morning. But I also join you as something else that I'm very proud of, and that is one of the sons and daughters of Africa uh, who call America our home. And just to share, you know, from the bottom of my heart, my belief uh, that we are people of linked fates, 
across oceans, across time, across history, uh, but still so much we share uh, in common with one another uh, in terms of culture, uh, in terms of how we show up in the world, and of course, in terms of the struggles that we face. Um, I can't um, help but to think about the irony uh, of the anniversary of the murder of George Floyd being on Africa Day uh, one year ago today, and to think about the role that youth in America uh, and youth across Africa have played in not only protests uh, and advocacy and speaking out uh, around his life uh, and the loss of it, but also for the protection uh, of their own lives. And as we know, Africa Day is a celebration of and commemoration of Africa's liberation, of Africa's freedom from colonial oppression and apartheid. Uh, but also, I think one of the challenges we have is that we tend to think of those things and speak of them in the past tense, right? The civil rights era, the decolonization period, uh, and even though we've moved beyond uh, those struggles in terms of European colonization, we still see so many challenges uh, that citizens face, that youth face uh, across the continent, and that so many youth have pushed back against successfully. Uh, one of the things I wanted to highlight is USAID's commitment uh, to the youth uh, of Africa, especially around key priorities related to poverty reduction, uh, and democracy and governance of which youth are such important drivers. Uh, when you look at the African continent, of course, 70% of its population is below the age of 30. And when you get to 70%, you're not talking about a special interest group. You're not talking about a kind of marginalized constituency. You are in fact talking about the people who make up the lifeblood, the dynamism, the ingenuity, and the creativity of the African continent today and in the future. Uh, and while so many young people face challenges throughout their lives, leadership programs like Yali, like Yali tend to recognize the brilliance uh, in African youth, tend to recognize the importance and criticality of engaging youth uh, in their present and in their futures. I think that so much uh, of the conversations around youth often end up being future oriented when in fact youth are here now, uh, present now, and in many ways ready to lead, contribute, and be listened to now. Uh, USAID experience, of course, demonstrates that educated, healthy, employed, and civically engaged youth drive economic growth, uh, democracy, and governance, security and prosperity. However, when we fail to effectively engage youth and address our unique needs, it can lead to violence, instability, unrest, and issues of migration. We have seen this challenge increase given the global youth bulge, the rise of violent extremism, and the high global youth unemployment. This is why investment in programs such as Yali is so critical. Yali engages youth as key partners and nurturers and nurtures them, excuse me, as leaders for today and tomorrow. This approach we hope leads to confident, educated young people and better development outcomes. And I will just share that from the USAID perspective and from the US perspective and its engagement with Africa, we do not see this as a sideshow we see engagement with the continent and its youth as the main event. Um, by working in partnership with the private sector, national governments, youth and civil society, Yali has trained, mentored and collaborated with 24,000 young leaders across the continent to foster community, regional stability and stimulate economic growth and development in their countries. What does this look like in practice? Well, USAID is committed to examining ways to expand YALI beyond its current parameters. We're planning for the next phase of our investment, which includes expanding leadership activities, amplifying alumni-led impacts, and strengthening the work of regional leadership centers. We want to help citizens and leaders drive and build their own futures based on transparency, accountability, and inclusivity for all. We want to provide opportunities for the next generation, 
including all of you here today, to take on leadership roles at national, regional, and local levels, which you're already doing, and we want to help you to amplify. Together, all of you will build a foundation and are building a foundation for strong and resilient societies. We have seen empowered, how empowered leaders can make a difference. Young leaders like Flavia Kalule in Uganda, who was recently elected as a member of parliament for the Kasanda district, Kasanda district. She isn't alone. Patience Masua, 22 years old, was recently elected as the youngest member of parliamentary research and advisory committee for the ruling party in Namibia. But it's not just individual leaders who will make a difference. It's the collective pan-African power of the vast Yali alumni network. Together, you have the ability to be a force for change. With over 24,000 alumni, you are becoming a movement of catalytic young leaders working together for an inclusive, prosperous, and resilient Africa. I, along with my colleagues at USA, celebrate Yali, celebrate Africa Day, celebrate the freedom, resilience, and independence of African people across the continent and across the world. We look forward to jointly collaborating with you on the vision for the next 10 years of Yali and cannot wait to see your ideas and ventures come to fruition. Now I'd like to hand it over to our keynote speaker for today, Ms. Ahuna Eziakonwa, UNDP's Assistant Administrator and Regional Director for Africa. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Atkins, for that. And I hope uh, those of you listening on the continent heard why so many of us were excited uh, when Mr. Atkins was uh, appointed to his position earlier this year. Uh, he talked about something that we often don't focus on, uh, the connective tissue of the diaspora as black people around the world, uh, the joint struggles uh, that we all must face and continue uh, to fight. And so thank you so much for highlighting that. More importantly, thank you for highlighting how USAID is centering uh, young African youth uh, within the broader framework of USAID uh, strategic engagement with the African continent. And I hope those of you listening on the continent heard that commitment from USAID and the larger US government to Africa's youth come through very strongly, very powerfully in Mr. Atkins' uh, remarks. So thank you so much uh, for those remarks. Let me now introduce our keynote speaker for today uh, that Mr. Atkins already uh, mentioned. And before I do, I just want to say that yesterday I introduced Mr. Serge Ibaka as a son of the soil. We've heard from another son of the soil, even if a few hundred years removed uh, in, in the sense of that uh, separation, but it is my great pleasure today to hear from, uh, to introduce so that we can all hear from a true daughter of the soil. And I'm thrilled that she is the one giving this keynote address on Africa Day. Ms. Ezia Konwa is a United Nations Development Program Assistant Administrator and Director of the Regional Bureau for Africa, leading over 1 billion in annual development program in 46 African countries. Her vision is contained in Africa's Promise, the UNDP renewed strategic offer in Africa. She established Africa Influences for Development, UNDP Tony Elumelu Foundation Partnership, Africa Young Women Leaders Initiative, Africa Innovates Magazine, and Africa Borderland Center. She has served in Ethiopia, Uganda, and Lesotho as UN resident and humanitarian coordinator, and was chief of UN Africa OCHA. She is a graduate of Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, Harvard Kennedy School Executive Program and the University of Benin. Mrs. Yakonwa, thank you for making the time to come and give this keynote address for us today. Over to you. Thank you so very much, um, Dr. Mnyangwa, for that kind introduction and warm greetings to you, Mr. Atkins, for setting the tone uh, this morning. I want to really start by thanking the government of the United States of America for this program, first of all, for this initiative. 
but also I feel so honored to be asked to keynote uh, this important uh, day. I'm truly humbled by this invitation because it's on a topic that is very close to my heart, as many of those I work with would know. So I, I feel very grateful and I want to say, yes, it's Africa Day and we, and Africa Week, and we celebrate it. And I, I totally associate myself with what uh, Mr. Atkins said earlier about George Floyd and uh, and the one year on and the, the reflections that we're going through and um, the fact that youth across the world, but also in Africa, have been at the heart of many protests for, for liberation, uh, whether we're talking about South Africa apartheid or many other um, areas of bondage. And uh, we reflect deeply uh, on this day uh, about what happened in this country also. I also want to congratulate Yali for 10 years. Your 10th anniversary virtual summit is more than validation that need remains and that you have zoned in on Africa's most precious resource, its young people understanding, mobilizing, and responding to the needs of Africa's young people is a passion that truly drives me. And I, I believe it is the recipe for the continent's transformation. In there, we have all the ingredients. There is not one thing that we can do successfully on the continent of Africa today, if it be of impact without Africa's youth. And so I join you in celebrating this great milestone and in challenging all of us to look ahead with promise at the next 10 years in which we will see a crystallization of the new Africa. I truly believe this. An Africa that's driven by its dig digital natives, its young and determined architects, that are teeming with the consciousness of social justice and social enterprise. And they are ready, very ready to lead. This is what we're finding. And this is what gives me so much encouragement and energy to continue on this path. We have a truly distinguished generation of youth on the continent of Africa who are not just out for themselves, but who are thinking of social change with everything that they've got, with their talents. And a program such as this that recognizes that and wants to build on it, it's one that we must celebrate. Because we often speak of youth as leaders of tomorrow. Yali recognizes that youth are already leading today. And everything in the reality of now tells us that Africa's youth, Africa's young people are breaking the ceiling and they're insisting that their time is now. What is the role of youth in driving Africa's development is what you wanted me to speak to today. For us in UNDP, youth really constitute the spine of Africa's development. They are the oxygen as well that feeds it. Let us dream for a second. When you start to gaze into the future and to live in the future, what does the future of that world look like by 2030, which is the year of the SDGs, only nine years ahead of us, young Africans will make up 42% of the world's youth and they will account for 75% of those who are under the age of 35 years in Africa. Africa is a unique and enviable situation, is in a unique and enviable situation with this kind of asset of immeasurable promise. If harnessed for its full potential to come through, Africa's youth, I believe, will be the cohort, the generation that broke the commodity curse that we've come to live with in Africa. They will be the generation that break the cycles of poverty that has become, made Africa a poster child for poverty. This will be the generation 
that breaks the back of the strong man of inequality. Africa's youth will deliver Africa's promise. This is not far-fetched uh, in terms of the prospect. We are dealing with an African youth that is empowered, enlightened, more connected than previous generations, and definitely deeply engaged. We're dealing with a youth core that is pressing for representation, not only as voices in parliament, but as citizens that are aspiring for leadership at the very top, pushing for reforms in communities in local governments, in cities, and bringing democratic transitions ab about. We saw this in several countries uh, on the continent, making changes in that on that front led by youth. Africa's youth are leading the fourth industrial revolution. From edutech to health tech to fintech, it is the young people that are creating homegrown solutions for the continent's unique challenges. For example, we see thanks to the innovation that we've seen in Kenya's youth, we now have financial inclusion. We struggle with this in the development world and I'm sure USAID has the experience as well for so long, for decades, we couldn't break through. Now we, have fin we can say we have financial inclusion to, to, that is also emerging in several other parts of the continent, advancing at a scale we never thought was possible in Africa. With M-Pesa, of course, as long as one has that mobile phone, they are that much closer to being banked. They can transact, they can pay bills, they can even build up a credit score and savings. It was Africa's youth that led the COVID-19 response in many respects. It's a story that's not been told really. Innovating with tools that allow self-diagnosis and triage to reduce pressure on weak health systems, creating wooden hand washing machines in villages that had no other materials but the locally available ones, creating oxygen cylinders, robot traffic cops to manage movement amidst the pandemic and more. UNDP has profiled these stories in our inaugural Africa Innovates magazine, which I would, uh, if you haven't seen it, I would really urge you to have a look at it because you begin to gaze into this promise that I described. There is certainly a success story there, but there is also the less rosy story, a story of betrayal uh, of potential, of failing dreams, of protracted inequality. There is a part of Africa's youth that fall within the 600 million Africans that do not have access to electricity, for instance. As a critical enabler to leverage in digitalization, access to energy becomes a foundational question for youth empowerment. And as the UNCTA Digital Economy Report of, of 2019 revealed, only one in five in sub-Saharan Africa has access to the internet. There is that gender question that is always in there, that Africa's young girls are even worse off, disproportionately affected. And even when a seemingly neutral catastrophe like the COVID-19 pandemic results in school closures, we see the impact on the girls. We know, for example, that the pandemic may force an additional 11 million girls out of school. Many will not be able to return with a snowball effect on their lives for years to come. And as we look at the future leadership of the continent, it has to be with the women, with the young women coming along. But we must right some of these wrongs that, are, that we're seeing now to be able to get there. There are also those youth in conflict affected regions for whom the promise of self-actualization is a distant prospect. It is up to all of us to change these realities. How can, for instance, the public sector harness the power of youth to transform Africa? This is why at UNDP, we are completely devoted and dedicated to, and we've made that decision that development programming that has no youth spine 
will not be rolled out by us. We, this is the next generation UNDP, recognizing on the continent of Africa, particularly that 75% of people cannot just be ignored and left behind. We're listening and we're ensuring that the listening post transform action uh, as into catalyst. Any development programming that is not attuned to the needs of Africa's youth, that is not youth informed, that is not youth relevant, it's actually not relevant. This is not an ideological issue, ladies and gentlemen, it is one of ultimate necessity, especially because the structure of Africa's economy is not endowed with natural invitations to for young people's engagement. You know, young people in Africa are usually not really listened to. It's usually, you know, you have to wait to grow up. And they have many, many fences to, 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 to uh, scale. The economy is relatively small if taken individually, have not been designed with the magnet of drawing young people into agriculture, into industry, or into services. And so it would take doing what the youth are very good at, disrupting the status quo, pushing the doors ajar, bringing your chair with you and sitting at the table of solutions. Time is over for finger pointing. You know that famous saying that when I point my finger at my neighbor, and you can just try it out, three more points back at you. This is when we look at ourselves and say, what are we bringing to the table? And if we're not at table, we do what it takes to get there. Public policy approaches must do three things. One, accept that with youth and with their core areas of thought, we do not have all the answers, but that such state of being is not necessarily bad. We must let them innovate while learning what the appropriate regulatory approach is. These regulatory sandboxes are critical to ensure that we are facilitating and not penalizing innovation. We still have far too many regulations out there that actually act as an obstruction to innovation, as a deceleration rather than acceleration of development. The second is that we must make engagement in productive sectors cool. For Africa to overcome its structural impediments, we have to get agricultural productivity up. We must add value to Africa's commodity and mineral wealth, and we must create industries to meet the demand of Africa's 1.2 billion people. We have to create environments for Africa's services sector to be competitive, offering diverse portfolios of products and expertise for the one Africa market just launched. Doing this successfully means drawing in young people. Thirdly, this means, and this it's the final point on this, that we must look beyond the gig economy maximizing digitalization as a tool to facilitate and expand production in Africa. Africa's youth must be facilitated, ladies and gentlemen, to build the continent's food industry, its clothing industry, its medical industry, and its creativity industry. It is not a luxury. As COVID-19 has demonstrated to us, the risk of offshoring the continent's basic supplies has survival implications. It is not impossible either. Africa's human capital is at its highest. We are now in a market with some of the most educated people in the world, thanks to long-term investment in public education. There will be need for technology and perhaps for sharpening vocational skills. And this is where partnerships and advanced with advanced economies like the United States under the YALI program can be particularly helpful. As I start to close, what are some of the opportunities I see? There is an opportunity to reduce the scale of forced migration by enhancing opportunities to fulfill dreams on the continent in Africa. We have to invest in such a way 
that will trigger African youths to scale the ladder of hope rather than scale the fences that make them end up in the Mediterranean Sea. A recent UNDP report on scaling fences, voices for irregular migrants to Europe, confirms that Africa's young people are living in drones, not because of lack of jobs, but because their ambitions and aspirations have outpaced what is possible at home. They are therefore scaling metaphorical fences, including dangerous seas, to get to the idea of a better life ashore. We also know that most of this movement is within the continent of Africa. And so this makes it even more urgent to ensure that a continent-wide approach is taken to create opportunities in Africa. Critics argue that not everyone can be an entrepreneur. At UNDP, we believe entrepreneurship is an important part of the solutions mix for youth empowerment. We are working with African philanthropists. We are working with African governments, with the businesses, with creatives. And we want to reach as many youth as possible. We want to do it with others like USAID and others who are working on this. Um, maximizing opportunities in intra-African trade under the Africa continental free trade area. I can't end this um, statement without mentioning AFCFTA. Unmatched opportunity to grow the Africa youth and their role in Africa's development. By 2050, Africa's population will have doubled to 2.5 billion people with a 7 trillion uh, combined GDP, $7 trillion combined GDP. This is your opportunity to make in Africa, to be the architects of those made in Africa products that the market is about. UNDP is working hard on this to support the rollout of AFCFT. And I invite all of us to shape the youth component of this one Africa market offer. Final reflections. You know, I invested five years of my life after college to a voluntary uh, service that enabled me to travel the world where I earned no salary in those five years. Those were the most fundamental years of my life because I learned how to live without money, how to live simply with the, the, with the little that I had and how to open my mind to the world I traveled Africa, I traveled the world in that time. I had the opportunity. I, it helped me to connect with what was possible in Africa. And that's why I'm here in the position that I am today, because that glimpse of the possibility, of the potential, of the beauty, of the richness of the continent and the belief that it could be realized and my, my life could somewhat contribute to that was important. So I leave you with a few last words to never stop to pick opportunities where you are volunteering and learning and building character that makes you incorruptible in whatever positions that you end up. You learn the discipline, you learn the flexibility, you learn what it means to be a global citizen. And these are all ingredients uh, for leading Africa today and in the future. I thank you and I know I may have overshot on time. Uh, uh, Dr. Muyanga and I apologize. I go back to you now. Thank you so much. And there's absolutely no need to apologize. I, and that was fantastic. Uh, the comments are flying in the session. They've been flying since Mr. Atkins started speaking and they've just doubled since you started speaking. So I'm glad you took the time to really share um, the, the messages that you have shared. Uh, they're resonating very clearly uh, with our young uh, African leaders on the, on the continent. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we do have uh, a few questions and I'm hoping both of you can stay on to uh, just engage with our youth. One of the questions that keeps coming up and it's coming up from all over the continent, just judging by uh, the names of the people who are asking the questions, has to do with what advice do you have given the challenges that African youth face, particularly in the political sphere, that there's this disconnect between the older generation of Africans who hold power and Africa's youth. 
how do we bridge that gap? How do we bridge that gap? So I will um, start with you, Mr. Atkins, and then come to Ms. Ezia Connor. Thank you for that. I, I always fall back on the a quote from the great Arthur Ashe, the great African-American uh, tennis player, when asked questions about where we start um, as youth, uh, as elders, uh, as rich people, as poor people. And he, he would say, start where you are, use what you have and do what you can. And I think one of the parts of this is really to honor um, the cultural ethic across the uh, African continent that deals with the respect for our elders, uh, but also to call on our elders to understand that they also must respect and honor and see and hear our youth. Uh, and I think for too long in many quarters, uh, youth have been uh, to be seen and not heard from, uh, but we wanna continue to push the em envelope to suggest that that day is over. Uh, and one of the things that I would remind us, even in our, our own histories, is that the elders of today were actually, in many instances, the fiery youth of yesterday who helped to push their countries uh, to independence, uh, to gain their prominence in the world, to secure the sovereignty uh, of African nations. Uh, and I think perhaps too many have forgotten what it is like to be in that position, what it is like to be unseen and unheard. But the thing that I would just share with youth across Africa and the world is that your treasure uh, and what you have, your gifts that you offer to the world do not depend on the recognition of your peers, do not depend on the recognition of those who are so-called leaders in your communities, in your states, regions, uh, and nations, but is a gift that you have to give to the world regardless of the opposition you may face in cultivating it and in sharing it. And so that really for me is a point of encouragement to know that throughout the course of our history in America, in Africa, that people trying to do the right thing and trying to force positive change have always faced opposition. And so you should see opposition not as a sign of discouragement, but as a sign of encouragement that you are on the right path, that you are in the line of history of those who pushed for the same kind of change before you and who faced similar kinds of opposition. And so again, to keep going, to start where you are, to use all the wonderful gifts that you have and do what you can individually and perhaps most importantly, collectively. Thank you, Mr. Atkins. Mr. Zakona, same question to you. Thank you. I think Mr. Atkins has really um, hit the nail on the head. I really associate myself with his comments there. Uh, you know, one thing we forget is that many of the pe founding fathers of, of the African continent who fought uh, for independence and decolonization were youth. They were in their 20s and 30s, you know, from Nelson Mandela to, to, to Thomas Sankara. These were young people. And maybe we need to recall that, you know, we need to bring back that history of, you know, how youth has played a part in, in Africa's uh, um, transformation. And we need an intergenerational conversation. I, I totally agree that, you know, there is, the, there is a gap. Um, I think we need to bring along the, the elders, you know, the, the, into a conversation with the youth and do so respectfully. I, I think we need to continue to underline respect uh, which is uh, cultural, traditional for us, uh, for age, uh, but at the same time create a platform, platforms for greater understanding. So for me, I think it would require an intergenerational conversation and we should all be creating platforms for that to happen uh, constantly until the change occurs. Thank you so much. Uh, and I hope that Yadibe, 
Leah and uh, the other young lady who asked this question uh, that you have uh, received. I mean, I certainly got it. And I, I hope you heard the message loudly and clearly uh, that do not let the pushback uh, related to resistance discourage you. Keep fighting. That is how change comes about. And so I think both uh, speakers, both from an African perspective, a US perspective, and looking at it historically, have laid that out clearly for us. But it also leads me to another question. And I think uh, Ms. Ahuna in particular, you touched on this, but I also know that this is an area that USAID uh, is involved in. How do we transform uh, Africa's uh, educational sectors to really help push this transformation? To enable uh, that educational sector to amplify what African youth can do to, to skill them with what they need uh, to be able to push Africa forward uh, in the 21st century. We know that COVID-19 exposed some of those gaps, those challenges uh, in the educational sector. There's also the gender uh, issue that Ms. Uh, Ahuna Eziakona uh, raised. How do we fold that into uh, the educational um, strategic plan uh, you know, for the, for the way ahead to make sure that we are not leaving young girls behind. I think that's part of how we can amplify what youth bring to the table. So any plans with regard to what UNDP could do and what USAID uh, is doing, uh, a lot of questions in here about how we can enhance employability of youth on the African continent. Uh, so this time, let me start with you, uh, Mr. Ziacono, and then I'll come to Mr. Atkins. It's a very important question. I mean, African governments have to overhaul uh, curriculum, the education curriculum. It needs an overhaul from Cape to Cairo. I think that we we need to uh, look at the reality of, of the job market and compare that to what we're teaching in classrooms. Um, and it's really disconnected completely. I, I, I've seen this in, in the country that I've worked in, we see it all the time. And the conversation is ongoing. I think countries are more and more aware of this disconnect. And it's, it's hard to do, it's hard to do. I know some governments have tried uh, because it means that you change everything. It requires resources. And I think that those of us working in the development uh, field ought to consider development assistance for governments to be able to make that transition, you know, because it's a whole value chain transition. It's not just you switch on the light and everything changes. Um, you have to change material, you have to train teachers, you know, so many things in that whole ecosystem that would need to change. And so some inv heavy investment in resources. And I think we should start looking at what development assistance has to offer in that regard. And then the last one is what we learn from outside the classroom. I think we need to um, look at education for the future, right? Uh, it is beyond the classroom now. It is beyond just a physical place in class. The whole digital aspect that can help us bridge the inequality that we see uh, between someone who is uh, in, in Karamoja in, in, in uh, Uganda and someone who is in Kampala, they will not have the same opportunity because teachers who are qualified may not go in those areas, but technology can help us get the high quality of, uh, of t math teaching to Karamoja kids that those in Kampala are receiving. So lots of uh, things to do there. And, and it's a challenge for us as development practitioners to, and policymakers to see how we can invest. We, we can't hear you. That reminder, Mr. Atkins. Thank you, uh, Monday. I would just say that I think that the cultivation of individuals uh, is in some ways a metaphor for the cultivation of the nation. Uh, that you can't be serious about pushing yourself forward if you don't dig deep into the potential of the people of your society. Uh, and I think that the other piece of this is that even if governments 
were not doing it because they thought it was the right thing to do or because they owed it to their citizens, it would be the smart thing to do, even from the perspective of enlightened self-interest. When you talk about a continent where 70 percent of the people are under 30 years old, you would be wise to understand that meeting their needs uh, and cultivating them is in the best interest of the stability and the wealth and the longevity uh, and the peace of your society. When you look at women who are over 50 percent of the world's population uh, and certainly of the continent's population, to ignore them would be foolish. Uh, they are the drivers of our society, the drivers of our culture, the drivers of our lives. And so I think re the recognition uh, that investment in that and returns on the investment in that can only be thriving uh, nations, thriving economies, thriving societies. And that's why we at USAID are so serious about the ideas of poverty reduction, uh, about the ideas of education, civic, basic, uh, and otherwise, recognizing that the true gift of the African continent, a place with so much under the soil, is the feet and the toes of the people walking on top of all that material wealth uh, and the treasure that lies with, within them. And so for me, it is a recognition of that, a cultivation of that, and a continued advocacy for people to have what they need to become who they were born to be. Thank you so much. And, you know, we're coming to the end of the session, but what I wanted to do is uh, a lot of comments coming in. I really appreciate all the engagement. I can't acknowledge everybody who's writing in, but it is uh, just absolutely flying in the chat group. What I'm gonna do is there are a number of questions that have come in specifically for UNDP and others that have come in uh, for USAID. We are going to collect those questions, assemble them into a document and forward them on uh, to uh, Mrs. Yocono's team and Mr. Adkins' team and to see what the uh, participants were saying. But let me just turn uh, to you each in under a minute. I know Mrs. Yakona, you've already done this, but there's so much wisdom in what you have shared with us. And I know that Mr. Atkins also has a lot of wisdom to share with us. So in under a minute, can you give a word of encouragement to the many African youth who are so engaged uh, in what's going on, what you've just said here today. Just one final word of inspiration or encouragement. So Mr. Adkins, and then I'll have Mrs. Yocona just close us off for this powerful session. Uh, Mr. Adkins. Yes, I, I would just share uh, that you all are gifts and that you are worthy of everything that you desire uh, in the world. No matter what is said about the continent and its people, no matter the representations uh, in the media, uh, I am assured and I hope that you are assured of your brilliance and your rightful place on the planet. Uh, and I'm so encouraged that you're not waiting and that you've never been waiting. You've always been working uh, on your own behalf. Uh, and I would just continue to encourage that posture in the world and that attitude that no one can save you except for yourself. Uh, and to remember that and to take it to heart and to work, work, work for your people, for your communities, for your nations, for your region. And ultimately that would benefit yourselves and also the rest of the world. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Mrs. Yakono, bring us home, please. Thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure to, to exchange. You know, I'm encouraged by you. I'm encouraged by Africa's youth. I, I, so, so I think actually it's me who feels encouraged. Why? Because this is the generation that really truly gets it, that is prepared to make sacrifices. Indeed, there are so many obstacles in your way, but I see story after story how you overcome how you, we don't even have to preach to you not to, you know, keep going and keep fighting. You are fighting, you are going, you are not allowing 
the, the, the obstacles in your way to stop you. I feel so inspired and encouraged by this generation. With that, I have, I have the confidence that you are the generation that will change Africa's story from this narrative of a dark continent to a continent of hope, a continent where you have breathing hearts, you know, where you still have some humanity left, where you can expect love, compassionate leadership to continue to drive our development agenda. I so believe in you. And I want to say you can continue to count on me and on UNDP to accompany you to this promise that we're seeing. You're muted again, uh, Monday. Thank you so much. What a powerful way to end this session. This has been an incredible session. I mean, I'm of the older generation, even I'm leaving inspired. So I can only imagine what this session has done uh, for all of you on the continent based on the comments that I am seeing in the chat box. It has been incredible. So I please ask you to join me in thanking Mr. Atkins and Mr. Atkins. Fantastic, fantastic session. Thank you so much. I will now invite all of you to join us uh, for the break. We have a short break before the next session. Yesterday, we heard from YALI alumni across the continent uh, on how YALI has impacted their lives. Uh, they all spoke in English, even though some of them were from uh, Francophone uh, African uh, countries. Today, we want to hear from uh, brothers and sisters across the continent speaking in French, sharing with us how YALI has impacted their lives. And so with that, I invite you to join us for the break, please. Thank you.